Welcome to the Reader House Author Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. I'm Alice Stockton Rossini. Join us here every Saturday night at 8 o'clock or listen to our podcast anytime on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Podserve, just to name a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where independent new authors come first. Abdul Qadir Ali reminds us of the reign of terror at the hands of Abdi Muhammad Omar, who ruled Ethiopia's Somali region between 2010 and 2018. While the nightmare has ended, those responsible for the horrors of that time have yet to be held responsible. And Ali hopes his book, The Covert Genocide, will be a wake-up call. He joins us now from East Africa. I actually don't know where to start with conversation with you, but... Uh, what I can tell you is that there is a nation who have been destroyed by the state violence, the state of Ethiopia, for nearly 30 years. Sometimes it's slowly genocide, and sometimes it's intense killing of civilians, and with no knowledge of outside world. And that's why I call it the book. I titled it the covert, covert genocide because the outside world, the world community is in the dark, the darkness of information about what happened to this nation. Only governments with links, political links with Ethiopia knew about what was going on, but the world community at large was absolutely ignorant of what was happening in this region. We know in history there were many genocides. We know what the Jewish people have suffered during the Nazi wars. We know what's happening in Palestine now. We even know what happened recently in Tigray region of Ethiopia. We knew massacre in Rwanda in early 1990s. We know Rohingya. We know many places. But the international community doesn't know anything about what happened. The proof of this, my claim, is that a, a team of United Nations have visited Ethiopia twice in the past during the past 12, 12 months. The, the, the aim was to investigate what happened in Tigray region of Ethiopia, particularly the, the rape, the widespread rape of women and the girls. But unfortunately, the universal rape of women and children in our region are unknown to the rest of the world, not to UN, not to international organizations. And no one knows about it. I myself I was a victim. I was imprisoned because I denounced the state violence against the civilians, and that's why I, I have chosen to go to prison myself, a prison called Jail of Garden, where I call it the stain on history in my book. It's a notorious prison. I have chosen to join those prisoners who have been tortured and who have been killed in their thousands for hunger. And though some have been tortured, I myself have been tortured. So I have chosen myself to victimize myself in solidarity with those victims. I am free now, I'm free. You're free now, uh, well, how long were you in prison? One and a half years, I spent one and a half years. How did you get out? The, there was a pressure, outside pressures, and I was released it. I guess the question is, what can the international community do? What can we do to help you? This is a good question. We like the UN, and human rights organizations, governments, to investigate what happened, the human grave, human rights abuses during the 30 years, the past 30 years, particularly the, the, reign, the reign of EPRF, TPLF, Ethiopia under the rule of TPLF, EPLF, which is not in power anymore. We like to be investigated as they are doing. Yeah, 
the genocide is not going on now. It stopped, but the wounds are, are already there. Wounds are there. The victims have never been helped in any form. The perpetrators are free and have never been brought to account. Some in power, still, still in power. Some have left the country, but most, most, most of them are here. They are living among the victims, and nobody asking them any questions. So what you're saying is you want the UN to come to the Somali region. Exactly. How do you go about doing that? It's not, it's not to me, it's to them. But it would seem to me you need to put pressure on the UN to come to your region to investigate. Yes. So how do you pressure the UN to come to your region when some of the people responsible for the atrocities are still in power? I am, you know, doing something individually. I, I'm alone. I have no, no, no power to even pressure the UN or any organization or any government. So I'm doing something on the basis of my feelings, individual effort. That's why I've written the book. That's all I can do. There's nothing else I can do. What happens if you get a group of people together? Can you protest? Will they just shut you down? Uh, I don't think that in the current situation in, in Ethiopia or in the region, I don't think that's possible. So you've written this book. Is there anyone in the United States? Is there anyone in Europe who knows about this book and who can lobby the UN on your behalf? I think I have done my maximum, uh, you know, maximum effort by writing this book, which took me nearly five years to bring it to what is now. After conducting an investigation myself, without having been trained for this job or having no any experience. I have done my efforts, and I believe I have done all I could. I'm just saying, you you have no connection to anyone outside of where you live who can help you. No. There, there are some, you know, sympathetic with me. There are some people locally, you know, happy with what I'm doing, although there are some threatening me. But they are sympathizers, but not not doing you know much of action. I had uh, a help of one person in the government, in the regional government where I live, that helped me conducting the investigation I've I've carried out. So you started writing this five years ago. Why? Why was it five years ago? Yeah. That was when the genocide stopped, and some political change, local political change did take place. You need to see the perpetrators punished. Yeah, I mean, the security situation in the region is a little better than it was before, but um, I know the regional government has also uh, established a commission for investigation, which I doubt their capacity to conduct such a complex investigation and bring in justice to those perpetrators. Is there anything I can do to get your book into the hands of the people who need it? Um, uh, I think what I need is to get the book to the, you know, the concerned people who have interest in defending human rights Whoever they are, whether they are governmental, governmental or organizational, or individual I, or whatever. You are able to reach out to human rights organizations, right? You have the internet, right? Hmm. Can you let these human rights organizations know about your book? I have tried very hard to contact uh, Human Rights, Human Rights Watch, and Amnesty International, the most famous. Right. Human rights organizations in, in, you know, in the world. I did not get any good response from them. Well, I hope this interview is a step in the right direction. Mm. Don't give up. You can't okay. give up.
there's got to be, I mean, if you just keep, if you just keep every day mm -hmm. emailing these organizations every single day, yeah. I feel frustrated for you. I even feel danger when you show in, you know, my face to the perpetrators in the region and, uh, and elsewhere. I know I'm, I'm, I know I'm in danger. My life is in danger. Because of this book? Yeah. What about the rest of your family? I don't think they are target, but I am the target. How do you stay safe? There's nothing, nothing I do, you know, to protect myself. Well, I'm glad I got the chance to talk to you, and I hope somebody hears this. How do people reach you? I have email, and Facebook, and other media outlets. Do they just Google your name? Yes, I have an, an email which I, I think the government of Ethiopia has, you know, watching it, is watching it for some time. I'm sure it's not even WhatsApp. Even WhatsApp? Yeah. I've seen some, some messages I've sent came back. Well, after they have reached their destination, they came back. A copy of them came back. And I know in the past, they, they, they have broken into many times. There's secret office. Ethiopian Secret Service has broken into my email many times and I changed it, you know, I went there abroad and changed the, the, the password. Well, I would think the kinds of organizations that need to reach out to you would find a way to get to you without putting your life in danger. I would think like a human, I would think human rights organizations would know how to reach you. I just hope, oh, but uh, as I have said, you know, I have no much energy left with me. <laughs> Don't give up yet. Don't give up. Yet. <laughs> All right, listen. <Lizzie, laughs> thank you so much for taking the time to uh, share your story thank with you. me. Thank you. Thank you very much. Be safe, and um, I, I hope the perpetrators will be punished. Hopefully. All right. You have a good day. All right. You yeah, too. Thank you. Got it. Bye-bye. Bye. For those lucky enough to make it to the U.S., there can be issues. Highlighted in our next book, Marriage Form in Nigeria. It's a clarification of Nigerian family law for anyone outside of the culture who might fall in love with a Nigerian. After decades of dealing with the uninformed, Reverend Matthew C. Iwuji thought it was time to write about it. In this age of increasing migration of peoples from one country to another, and especially here in the United States, there is a mixture of so many people from so many cultures in the world, so many places in the world. And sometimes people know themselves, especially uh, men and women, and they begin to interact, they become friends, and maybe they start thinking about marriage. So this book give, gives them information that they need to know uh, before they make a commitment that might be life lasting. Is there an issue marrying outside of your cultural background? No, it's, it's just a question of people marrying without knowing the implications of what they're getting into. What kind of implications? Well, that's what I'm trying to explain, that the law guiding marriage in Nigeria is a little complicated. There are four legal systems of marriage in Nigeria, guiding marriage. So we have uh, a marriage system with legal structure that says if you marry customary, it is legal. If you marry in the church, it is legal. If you marry in the state, it is legal. And so when, when you talk about customary marriage, you are also talking about Islamic marriage and 
Islamic marriage can be a religious marriage. It can be a customary marriage. And just like a Christian marries in the church, it is a religious Christian marriage, but a Christian first marries customary. So it, it's, it's useful information for someone who may not actually know this background. Can you give me an example of a potential negative implication? A potential negative implication might be that you marry by native law and custom, which is customary, and you don't know that that is potentially a polygamous system, that the man is allowed to marry more than one wife. It is legally uh, permitted and socially acceptable. In Nigeria, but not... In, in Nigeria. Yeah, but not here in the United States. In Nigeria, it is acceptable, and it's legal, and it's polygamous. And so let's say you marry an Islamic person, a person who is a Muslim. You must also know that the Muslim religion allows them to marry more than one wife. One man can marry more than one wife. And so if you marry a person who believes in that, thinking that you're going to enter into a monogamous marriage, and later on the man says, no, I'm marrying another woman. Oh. There's nothing you can do about that unless you want to divorce. Do women in Nigeria, aren't they familiar with the fact that they could be marrying a husband who could have more than one wife? They are. So is this book more for people here in the United States who, like a woman from America, falls in love with a Nigerian man and she might marry him thinking it's going to be monogamous and it's not? Exactly, exactly. It's, 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 it's for someone to be informed Oh. about the system so that before they make the ultimate commitment to marry, mm. they get a commitment from the person they're marrying that it's going to be monogamous. Okay. Give me an example of another implication. Another implication is if you marry into a customary marriage and you are a Christian and you later on marry in the Christian church, and that marriage ended by divorce, and now you're seeking to marry, it is important when you go to a church tribunal that you make your case about marrying this person who married customarily. And so he had another wife before he married this person. And now they are divorced. And now she's looking for an annulment. And so the church tribunal must seek to nullify that marriage. And so it's important not, not only for the individual person to know, to have this information, it is important for a student lawyer to know this. It is important for teachers who teach law also to have this book. It's important for church tribunals also to have this book. And so it's going to be a very useful resource for people. Well, particularly people who, you know, work in the legal profession. Yeah, because the book is based upon legal structure in Nigeria, the legal structure that allows people to marry according to the different structure, marriage structure that they prefer. Right. So in your 30 years, have you ever had to deal with intercultural marriages that ran into trouble? I deal with that all the time. Oh, that's why you wrote the book. I, yes. I used to work in the church tribunal, and, and cases come before the tribunal about... Uh, let's say a Nigerian brings a case before the tribunal. 
and and so knowing this background and having this background information helps the tribunal personnel to actually find out the justice that they deserve. In other words, to look into the background, what is it that this person had in mind when he married this woman? Was there a divorce mentality mm. in his life? In other words, yes, if he lived in, in a culture where people marry several women and divorce them at will, then obviously that person has a divorce mentality knowing that, okay, yes, society allows it in Nigeria. People can divorce at will and they can marry as many as they want and divorce them. And so they have it in their mentality. And so later on, it might affect them. It might uh, become an issue if they got married and wanted to divorce or wanted to marry again somebody else. So I'm assuming in Nigeria, if you marry a couple of women and you want to divorce one and you've had three kids with her, that there are no uh, strings attached, like you don't have to pay for the children, you don't have to support the wife, you can just say, I'm done with you, I'm out of here? Well, that is the normal practice. So there's no but, monetary, because that makes it a lot easier. If you don't have to fork over any money and you can just marry women and get rid of women and have as many kids as you want, and you don't have any financial responsibility, it makes it a lot easier to do. Here in America, there's financial responsibility, and a lot of people stay together because of that. You're right. You're, you're, you're very right. And, and the bottom line is that nobody enforces anything in Nigeria, so... When you marry a Nigerian, you need to you need to be careful and be sure of what you're getting into. I'm not saying that uh, there is no normal marriage in Nigeria. Right. There is, but there are so many pitfalls, and people need to know that and be careful. Yeah. Well, this is very interesting. Thank you. I I, I thought I needed to leave something behind for people, you know, uh, because you never know what helps someone. Yeah. And, and sometimes people don't want to read, but it's good to leave it there. If, if law schools discover this book and, and teach uh, their students about the different structure, marriage structures in different countries with Nigeria as an example, I think the situation in Nigeria might be the same in so many third world countries. Most countries in Africa, uh, in South America, in India, I think they have the same, uh, I would say they have the same structure. Hmm. It may not be written in books, but it is there. Right, right. Well, it's written in a book now, thanks to you. Yes. Thank you. And and women need to know that they have some recourse. When they get into a situation like that, then the tribunal can give them justice if the tribunal has this book. And if the women have this book, they have this information. Right. Yeah, it's good. It's good that it's out there. Yes. Now we have to make sure people find it. Exactly. And <laughs> It's the people who right. come in from the outside and you fall yeah. in love with a Nigerian man not realizing like, hey, you would hope you would talk about these things, but, you know, not everybody does. <laughs> I know, especially when they think they're in love, they don't want to hear anything. No, of course not. They don't want to know. But then later on, when they break up, yeah. then it becomes a big problem for them. Right. Well, Reverend, this sure has been interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. A survivor of the killing fields in Cambodia, Toro Sanya Vaughn writes in riveting detail his family's escape to America in his book, The Refugee Journey, War, Hope, and Liberty. You've been in America for almost 30 years, and now you've decided to tell your story. You must have felt it was important to, to do that now. 
Well, absolutely. I, I think it, um, is it the conversations uh, that what would be the important is that, I mean, uh, people reminding me that, that, that writing the story of my life is important because of, uh, um, did you know, different time from high school and college and now mid many places, you know that you have to tell the story because it's a, but I don't know how, but now it's more important than ever as a father. And I would love to leave this uh, story uh, for them. And, and, and then also now it is important to just, I want to have the engage of the conversation. And that is truly important to know that a part of your history, and that's why it's uh, write down and, you know, for the left behind, for the child's, or even just the story. Uh, right. And I think it's important to be able to see that this is about the memory uh, of the stories of my life and the life of Cambodian people. Um, you know, I always say that it's uh, in a thousand days uh, under the sun, uh, we survive of the war and genocide. So I was born in a breath of flames of the war, and we made through it in just a blink of an eye in the darkest histories of Cambodia. And, you know, so I left the country after war and war after war and leaving us refugee along the Thai border uh, where, um, for about 11 years in five different uh, refugee camps because of the conflict uh, of war. And not even that, you know, I survived um, and made it across the ocean to United States, uh, but, you know, we're striving. And, and, and that is an important part of the stories as well, that, you know, in the depth of the despair, uh, um, and then there's a, a light and hope, um, particularly, I always say that um, God give me the coldest winter, but, you know, and make it the beautiful springs. America's is my beautiful spring. And, and the title of the book is called The Rigid Journey. You know, and the refugees is a particular group of the people have been uh, exalted of their own countries that affects by wars. Um, so we just take a look back of the wars um, in, in memory of, of American histories as well. It's called the Vietnam War. That fire of the Vietnam War is like a wildfire that spread all over to Asia, particularly to Cambodia, and unstoppable. Not even that the war was end for the United States, 1968, 70, um, you know, and then 75, that when Cambodia fall into the hand of the communists, and from 75 to 79, uh, Cambodia now we call it three years and eight months under the genocide and and killing and, and, and destructions and the country turned upside down and 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 that was the hardest part of uh, Cambodia history. Were you all by yourself when you came, when you went into the refugee camps and when you came to America? What happened to the rest of your family? No, those, actually, I mean, the war affected everybody. I mean, seven million some more of Cambodia, particularly my families, uh, you know, and, and the whole family were affected by it. Um, so we were, after, uh, until 1979, uh, and then, you know, we thought that the war was over, but it's not. It's just not beginning another war. Mm. If you remember in the histories uh, of the uh, Soviet Union in mid Eastern Europe in 1979, include Afghanistan, and then the communists invade Cambodia uh, by the Vietnamese communists. So the ideological of the war with the, the West and the communism 
uh, of the Soviet Union or were actually is even get bigger and bigger. Right. Um, those are the, the a part of that uh, war until Reagan come to power. And that's when we really, you know, take a look back to Asia again, that these are the people who are fixed by the war. I mean, the war with the Soviet Union and communists. And not even the Vietnam War was the same thing. But Cambodians are always a counterpart with the United States, secretly yeah. working to fight it, fought with it. But until, you know, American could not uh, have to, cannot afford it, the war because not just it costs too much, it's too long. So we signed peace agreement with the Viet Cong, but peace never come to Southeast Asia. Right. Uh, so the Viet Cong is a uh, Viet Cong, you know, took over South Vietnam. The last day of American left uh, Asia and South Vietnam, but they never looked back mm -hmm. because, you know, and then that, 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 then the Cambodia had to stood up, you know, right? and the Viet Cong come to finish it in Cambodia. That's when the genocide will begin. Pol Pot, the, the leader, Right. As we know, uh, he is the uh, the the Pol Viet Cong, right. and he comes just to kill the rest of the Cambodians and the rest of the uh, whoever. It was the revenge, and it was a part of that war. And I don't think uh, a lot of people after that Vietnam War they didn't look back. Right. So you 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 go through all of this in your book. Yeah, and my family, you know, I was born in, then I was, you know, after the, uh, I was born in 1977, uh, in the midst of this flame of war, uh, and I made through it, my family would have to escape it um, until 1981, 82, and then 83, and then we were separated because the war would keep going on, and then we have to escape it, our Cambodia to Thailand along the border, so you were a kid. I was a child. Uh, I was small child, mm. but I remember it all. Uh, I, I just because it's all of your lives are always questioning why me. And then you try to understand all of this, that by politics of war affects your life. And all of your life, you want to understanding it. Why so much of this fear, of this suffering, to, you know, you know, as a child and affect me so much and and then I tried to understand it that, that was uh, the root cause of all of that but just I mean I mean, always say do not go to war because war is like a wildfire sooner or later we'll burn our own home well let me tell you that's a message that needs to be driven home right now don't you think uh, absolutely uh, war can happen anywhere in the world and then can be any country at any moment, because war is is coming from within the distress, the disagreement, and the conflict, and then lead us to call revolution or evolution or whatever. But never, never start a war, because sooner or later, you will kill your own people, will, will destroy your own home, and that is an yeah, it's just a bling of an eye uh, at the destruction is in, in, in endless. So the message is that never start war. Um, mm -hmm. the, the way you know of life, example, you know, take your kids for a pizza, go walk for coffee, the life that you know is going to be flipped upside down. Yeah. And, uh, so, you know, that's, that's the message. So any chance and this is called engage the conversation and i am the living witness i live through it i can you know I, i'm not taking sides of any kinds but i rather just give you a perspective last week matter of fact i was in got invited to washington dc for uh, for five days and i got invited to talk with the uh, radio free asia and the voice of america and also a book signing with the Cambodian community in Washington, D.C. And they are the one who survivor of this. Uh, they are the refugee and also the descendant of refugees as well. And I got a great support. 
And also the reason I wrote this book is, is I want to write a really simple uh, reading and for the middle school and high school, because this is a part of American stories as well. Um, you know, and one who come to this country at age of 15, speak no English, come in empty hands, and then striving, you know, and striving and try to make it better. Um, you know, and the message, it's it just uh, a, a great message. And I, I would say the message in the book word that the inspirational uh, message that I say that if you live in a free country as a free man, you can achieve any dream you want. And I want to say that it's a love story, a love and gratitude to American people that this book um, uh, is that thank you to America to give my family and the rest of refugee a chance uh, to make it home. Now all this freedom that I am in I don't take life for granted. It is the power within for me to know that I'm a free, you know, I'm, a, I'm living as a free man. I can define my, my destiny. You've already been on Voice of America. It sounds like you already have some traction here. I hope you're able to spread your message far and wide because on a personal note, I am scared to death right now about the war in Ukraine, Russia, you know, it just seems like you, we are on the brink of something horrible. Well, it, it um, um, you know, when you talk about that, and and and, and it, it's truly, uh, uh, it, even me, because it's hard, because I went through already, I know the scary part for me is, is that, like you say, I am the survivors of this. And I know, you know, I, I like I say, I try to understand in uh, the world conflict, and I just want to send the message of, of, you know, peace. And and you know, it's it's so difficult just to live through war, even harder to write about war. And the most difficult for me is that's what you just say is that the conflict in the world. I can predict it. Right. I can predict it. What future might bring it to us as humanity? in a bring of an eye, even the destruction, because this is the wildfires already started. The, you know, the war in Ukraine, uh, the Middle East, uh, Africa, and, and, and many parts of the world. And what happened is, you know how it is deja vu. I mean, it, they just started all over again and again. And it's such a destruct. I mean, for me, it was disturbing. Because I can not, and so what can I do? Because I know what's going to happen. Right. And maybe this conversation just reminding us that's all. I all I could do is I cannot stop who making war, but I know what happened when when war happened. We talk about the refugee. This is the refugee journeys. Right now, about twenty nine millions people are expelled off the cause of war, all over the world. Twenty nine million. That is a lot of, but whoever talk about this, whoever bring to the conversation on the table, you know, we have some priority to be talking about, but we never talk about this. If we talk about war, we just taking size instead of going to the depth of the cause of war that brings so much destruction and painful, which is we know that, you know, we see it, but I really, truly, we, you can't do anything about it. And it is heartbroken and and couldn't believe it, how human could do to one another again and again, again and again. If we start talking about, I mean, the power in our hand that can destroy this world three times more, what kind of power is that? What kind of power are you talking about? Right. The what kind of power that, when we could just destroy the, yeah, you know, everything would be destroyed? Exactly. What, so what what's kind the of point? man are you? What right. kind of country are you? What kind of humanity are you? Have you have a heart that shares the same feeling? From the tears of our despair, which is the taste of the ocean, I always say from the depth of the ocean, I mean, the, from the depth of the sea to humanity, within us, we share the same feeling. With our of the tears of despair, we taste the salt, and then we taste the same 
ocean. And that's why I think we share the same feeling. That's what makes us as humanity. But instead, instead of plan of the seed of hope in this garden of life, that what God promised us. We then say, okay, I have 210 nuclear weapon. You know, I, I and I have 500 more. And that's what they are talking about. It's just one man has so much power can destroy this world. We have not learned the lesson yet. Nope. And I'm really uh, disturbing on that as well. Uh, yeah. Toro, thank you so much for your story. And um, I wish you the best of luck getting getting your message out. Well, that's what ho I hope is the, the, the refugee journey is war, hope, and the liberties is the message that I want to send it to the trails of war and the pursuit of the peace. And, and you know, I want to, it's the courage of those who want to be a better life. Yep. And I hope we come to united all of us to say that, you know, let's work. There is the other way. There is diplomacy. You know, there is humanity that we can have more meaning to us, to our depth. Look my depth down to our feeling who we are. And God give us the lies and create us with the harmony and peace, but we're ignoring it. But I always say that because with that alone, it depends on us. What we would want to define our earth, our home, we call home. Um, so I hope that we can send the message of peace and, of course, uh, uh, we can uh, uh, unite it and plant these seeds and hope one day and one generation can, can flourish it um, and not just in, you know, maybe spread around the world. That is the message and uh, and be practice of sympathies and compassion and diplomacy and country to country. I think we can sit down and talk about it and solve the problem mm -hmm. for a young generation to come. Thank you so much, Toro. Well, thank you for having me, and I'm re really, really honored uh, to talk to you. We hope you enjoyed this edition of the Reader House Author Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. I'm Alice Stockton Rossini. We hope to see you back here every Saturday night at 8 o'clock, or listen to our podcast anytime on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe just to name a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where independent new authors come first.